I'm Hannah Creme. I'm presenting with EJ Carter. Um, we're mostly going to present on a project we've been doing at Lewis and Clark College for the last few years, but I'm really interested in making this a discussion about how to build diversity in archival collections and representative histories. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to leave <laughs> uh, some time at the end for questions, not just questions, but discussion. I end my part of it with several discussions to the group. Um, and I imagine EJ has questions for the group as well. Um, so, so although we might talk for 40 minutes, I'm hopeful that it'll be more like half an hour and we'll have lots of time to chat. Um, I'm also going to try to play several sections of the oral histories that we've been collecting over the course of this project. Just good luck to everyone with that working out, but I'll try. Um, okay, so let's get started. So, as you know, this panel is designed to ask questions. We'll attempt to provide some answers to these by the lessons we've learned through our LSTA funded project, Vietnamese Portland History Memory Community. But I also expect that the questions themselves will lead to a fruitful discussion. To this end, as I've just said, we'll leave a lot of time at the end for discussion. So, this panel is asking who built Portland? What cultural moments in our neighborhoods reflect that? What is the history of the city and where is it recorded and is it complete? Uh, starting from these questions, this panel begins from the understanding that history is recorded by, by most archives, that, sorry, that the history that is recorded by most archives reflects the people in power. Working backward, we ask how this can be corrected to make sure that libraries and archives across Oregon instead record a history that reflects the diverse makeup of the state. We examine case studies from libraries who work to build community collections and consider their successes, challenges, and failures. And we explore what has been left undocumented and which eras, groups, and individuals have been overlooked by historians until now. Finally, we examine the work left to do. And in our case, we're looking at a specific population within Portland. In 2016, national rhetoric became more loudly polarized. One of the groups that became a target of disproportionately negative rhetoric was immigrants. This led us as archivists, librarians, and historians to think about how we could push back against vitriol by making tools available for research and to tell stories. We started to think about how to do this. Despite Lewis and Clark having a long tradition of activism and support for diversity, we still have a fairly homogenous faculty and a student body that that is relatively white, and we don't have a lot of ties to organizations or communities aligned with non-white groups. So we decided to manufacture those connections by using oral history to create a collection documenting the Vietnamese American community in Portland. According to the 2010 census, Portland is one of only three large cities where over 2% of the population is of Vietnamese descent. In Portland, it's 2.1%, and the other two cities are San Diego and San Jose. And while other organizations were already working on collecting materials from Portland's Black, Japanese American, Jewish, and Latino communities, we weren't aware of any specifically studying or collecting around Southeast Asia or the Vietnamese community. This group, which has shaped many streets, shops, restaurants, and neighborhoods, and indeed the culture of Portland itself, was relatively undocumented. In the future, researchers who want to understand our city would need stories and access to this community, which we're lucky is still almost complete. The first generation of immigrants from Vietnam that came to America is largely still alive, so we're still in a position to talk to the entire scope of the history as it exists in Portland so far. Our thought was that the begin that beginning with an oral history project would lay the groundwork and build the kind of relationships that would eventually let us selectively collect the papers of individuals and re the records of organizations. There's a rich culture of oral history at Lewis and Clark, Oral history projects are the cornerstone of our required history methods course, and so we have a large and well-trained population of student workers from which we could draw. Furthermore, E.J. Carter, special collections librarian, who works with this project and contributed to an oral history project at Chicago State University, that dealt with questions of race in urban campuses in the late 1960s. That said, I had never conducted an oral history project. I had never actually worked with a history project before. So while we had some expertise, there would also be a steep learning curve. 
We began in the late summer of 2017 by conducting a series of information gathering interviews in which we started to get a sense of the issues people would want to talk about or not talk about as the case might be. And we began to develop an idea of some of the main dividing lines within the community, especially generational, religious, and political. Community members urged us to be conscious of differences between the various waves of migrants, starting with South Vietnamese government elites who left in 1975, the poorer and more rural waves that often left by boat in the late 1970s, the orderly departure program of the 1980s and the humanitarian operation of the 1990s. While this is oddly not necessarily something that's come up in the interviews themselves, it has been an important context for almost everyone with whom we've spoken. We recorded our first interviews in December 2017, at the same time we started the process of applying for an LSTA grant to fund the project more broadly. We initially proceeded pretty slowly. In the first six months, we only did about four or five interviews. We were awarded the LSTA grant in the spring of 2018 and funding started on July 1st. We had the money to hire a temporary consultant, one of our early interviewees, who, had made a who made a series of introductions for us. In this, we were really lucky. We worked with Dr. Connie Wynn, who herself has run a research program into the Vietnamese community in Portland through Oregon Health Sciences University. She studied traditional and cultural barriers to women's health within the community. So she had an understanding for the process of research, although she brought a particularly scientific bent to it, which wasn't always quite what we were going for, but she's been tremendously helpful throughout. <laughs> she recommended that we adopt the snowball technique for finding respondents, asking our interviewees for references to further participants. This has sometimes worked, but not always. Sometimes the threads of references can dry up, and while people will say that uh, in an interview, you should talk to my aunt or my coworker or my neighbor, they don't always follow through with an introduction. Sometimes the person they mention isn't, worth it, isn't willing to be interviewed. And as we've increasingly encountered, sometimes there is a language barrier that makes the introduction and the interview impracticable. I'll return to this issue later on. We also started training students that summer, in the summer of 2018. And we've encouraged them to take on as many of the elements of the project as we could both because we have other responsibilities to juggle and because we want this to be a student-driven project that isn't just a series of mindless tasks, but one that gives them really useful real-world experience. We appointed one student as project manager, but this role shifts from year to year and moment to moment, and that fact introduces confusion and a lack, and a lack of continuity. In our most upcoming application to the LSTA for further funding, we've asked to make that project manager role a official adult on the project, which at least means we should be able to keep them for a year. Sometimes students aren't even available for a year, but they shift from semester to semester. And while almost every project manager we've had has been great, you can imagine how dropping the thread of an email four months into it can really throw a wrench in the works. Working with students has been one of the best and most rewarding parts of the project. They've really stepped up and taken ownership of it and have introduced innovations and improvements. They buy flowers for people and send thank you cards. And to our befuddlement, they ask us to personally contribute to Vietnamese civic associations. Uh, they show up at community events on Saturday afternoons, which is great because we find that two adults hovering in the corner doesn't invite that much interest. But when there's a student who's eagerly asking people about their story, people are really eager to talk. Uh, until recently, there are four students working on the project. Quarantine has doubled that number because this is a rare project within the library on which progress can be easily made and done remotely. The most labor intensive thing that they do is transcribe interviews, but they also schedule and set up interviews, introduce new participants, monitor our email account, which is essential because I'm very bad at that. I can't remember more than one password. I still don't know the password to the Vietnam email account, but the students do. I assume they've written it down somewhere and, accompany, and they accompany us to events and to the interviews themselves. They scan photographs and documents as our collection of mostly oral history also extends to include digital objects. Even before 2020, we ran into problems and challenges with the project, some foreseen and some not foreseen. We certainly knew from the beginning that there would be issues involving cultural familiarity, sensitivity, and our role as outsiders seeking to both serve the Vietnamese community but also profit from them in the form of a new collection within our archive. Our hope is that Oral history would be a good starting point in the sense that it allows narrators and participants to take a hand in shaping the historical record and that involving ordinary people 
and institutions in this way would help build relationships and eventually perhaps allow us to establish physical collections as well in the form of scrapbooks, correspondence, organizational records, and so forth. But we've certainly found that in some cases it's hard to get people to open up. And especially in the course of a single interview, people can be uncomfortable. And in some interviews, it quickly becomes apparent that it's going to be hard to get the person to do anything or tell us anything beyond their general demographic and biographical information about themselves. People are often not willing to talk about political issues. When we ask the question, what are the political issues affecting the Vietnamese community in Portland? They often talk about the human rights and about human rights in Vietnam itself, or a desire to see the regime change or a revival of South Vietnam. This leads into our most recurring challenges. Many people are eager to tell their story and they want it to survive for generations to come. But the story they want to tell is about the old country, about Vietnam and the war and why they're here. These stories are poignant and important and they give us insight into the people who make up our community. But they do not help us develop a history of the city of Portland as such. Questions about their experiences here, about their impressions of the city, and about the challenges they faced are often met with the answer, it's so beautiful and green. There's a palpable discomfort with expressing any dissatisfaction with the city uh, to us, who I think may seem like representatives of Portland or boosters rather than archivists aiming to document a complete and thorough experience. When people talk about the American war in Vietnam, it can be wrenching. A number of people suffered enormously during the war, experiencing firsthand fighting, either as soldiers or civilians. Many were in re-education re camps after the war, many times for up to a decade. There are many stories of family separations during the war, and many people have harrowing stories of escaping Vietnam by sea. These riveting narratives are worth a great deal of attention and respect. But from the beginning, we've wanted this project to be a history of Portland and the Vietnamese Americans in Portland, and not just another account of the war, which has been fairly amply studied and covered, maybe less so on the Vietnamese side, but there is a significant representation, representative archive at Texas Tech's Vietnam Center and the Southeast Asian Archive at UC Irvine. Another issue I think we struggle with is the absence of a clear center of the Vietnamese American community in Portland, or to put differently, the degree of diversity within the community itself. Not only do people arrive at different times under different circumstances, they live in different parts and regions. Some are urban, some are suburban, they have different levels of education and different career paths and different religions. Despite the fact that the Vietnamese community in Portland is relatively substantial for a city of its size, it's notable how many people describe growing up without a Vietnamese neighbor or of being one of only two Vietnamese children in their classes. As one of our students, Aizen Jockey, showed in a senior thesis, the city actively worked to prevent high concentrations of refugees in a single area, preventing the emergency sorry, the emergence of a kind of central neighborhood or city sector and encouraging the dispersal of Vietnamese throughout the metro region. High levels of geographic and socioeconomic mobility in ensuing years have made it hard to point to institutions with the exception of the base Catholic Church, Our Lady of Levang, and the annual Tet Festival hosted by the Vietnamese community of Portland that bring people together. This is in line with the distinction that scholars of immigration have drawn between earlier immigrant communities in the United States that were high density and thick and had thick social bonds and a degree of linguistic hom homogeneity and sometimes stretch over multiple generations as opposed to newer waves of immigrants, which are characterized by much higher levels of mobility. There are a few, there are a few exceptions like Vietnamese, like Vietnamese communities in Westminster, California, which are ethnically uniform and can support little Saigon type commercial areas. But in places like Portland, immigrant groups are far more spatially fragmented. The East Portland has generated its own commercial centers, initially along Northeast Sandy Boulevard, and now in Southeast 82nd Avenue in the Jade District. But the community itself tends to live throughout the metro area and in suburbs, and that makes it harder to capture characteristic or typical experiences. But in many ways, um, the community is still very cohesive. Everyone knows somebody and everyone has interacted at the same church or choir or something. And the fact that it doesn't have a single story to tell makes the challenging work of collecting oral history seem all the more prescient and the opportunity to document the complexity of these, these members of this community is typical of the larger com community of Portland seem all the more urgent.
we've had a few ideas for addressing these issues. We stopped asking people about their lives chronologically so that they wouldn't focus particularly on their lives in Vietnam. And instead, we now start with their arrival in Portland, their impressions and experiences here, aspects of the public school system, public transport, immigration, and how they've developed a circle here. And then if we need to, we go back to their experience in Vietnam if it seems relevant. We're also conscious that many people would open up more fully in the Vietnamese language. And so we partnered with the Asian and Pacific American Network of Oregon to offer Vietnamese language interviews that are later translated. We would also like to pursue multiple or follow-up interviews with individuals, hoping that over time they will become more comfortable with us and their uh, and their narrators and their lives will open and their narrations, sorry, of their lives will open up and deepen. And finally, another suggestion we've entertained is that rather than interview people in the somewhat artificial setting of a typical oral history, we could ho hold and record discussions among friends and relatives or coworkers in places like restaurants, shopping centers, and nail salons. These would be less structured interviews in which we'd let people talk in Vietnamese about their lives and memories and translate them after the fact. However, this would require a heavy, heavy reliance on translators, which creates its own challenges, but it's potentially the best way to get a true and more thorough picture of people's lives and thoughts. We've been lucky to work with several Vietnamese community organizations, including the Vietnamese Community of Oregon, the Asian and Pacific American Network of Oregon, the Vietnamese Student Association at Portland State University, and the Vietnamese Senior Association. The, their guidance and that of the Immigrant and Refugee Community Organization has been invaluable. So as we sort of start to move into our next stage of the project, which is to think about dissemination and engaging audiences with our collection, I'm gonna hand over to EJ, but particularly on issues of dissemination, I'm quite keen to hear what people think in discussion because we really haven't gotten that far into dissemination ourselves. So I'm quite keen to hear what people in a range of libraries think about how we might, how we might engage people with the collection itself. Before I hand over to EJ, who is gonna talk about our first effort to engage people with the collection via um, podcast, I wanted to play just two excerpts that demonstrate both the poignancy and interest of the stories we've collected, but also the challenges we've encountered. One is from um, Min Tran, a professor of dance at Reed College, who will tell us about how he developed his own company, uh, dance company, and the complexity that had for him as a Vietnamese immigrant to Oregon. And this is a really great example of just the odd depth of the human experience in Portland, particularly in this community, but also more generally. But then I'll also play an example um, from William Fo Wong. William is a survivor of the war and of re-education camps who went on to found Rose VL, one of the best reviewed Vietnamese re restaurants in Portland and actually in America. But unfortunately, we interviewed him in his restaurant. He wanted us to interview us, him in his restaurant. He closed the restaurant for us and he gave us several different examples of the soups for which he's famous but there's clanking in the background and it's almost unintelligible, even though he's telling us some of the most poignant stories that we document in the archive. So I wanted to play those two excerpts for you, which will just take two minutes, but it requires on me to, it requires me to share the sound on my screen. So let's see if I can do it. So I clicked share computer sound, which might mean you're hearing me in an echo, who knows. And then, um, now, uh, looks chaotic. So first we're hearing from Min Tran, who's a dance professor. They, they sent me and I got introduced in the summer when I'm not in the grad school. I was sent to UCLA because they were offering a program called Asian Pacific Performance Exchange Program. Because school is closed, so they opened the uh, fraternity uh, place. And they host all the artists. So there was 40 artists were selected, but only five from the United States. The other 35 were from all over Asia. They have mastered their own form in music, dance, theater, film design, even. Um, so 40 of us stay in the frat room um, together. So we took over one building, um, four floors. 
And these artists are serious masters. And so I get to work for eight weeks with them, 24-7. We eat, we sleep, we work together. So I did that for, and I was lucky enough to get chosen two years in a row. Mm -hmm. So in the summer, I was gone. I mean, I'm just, but you know, that eight weeks, you totally dropped out of earth. You, nobody knows where you were like, what are you doing? Because you're just working seriously with these people for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But that's because of that, it, it sort of formed me the network and sort of began to search for my, my true identity. And it's actually, I have to admit, not until then, I finally look at myself as an Asian. I work so hard from to be uh, part of America for so like okay, I have to be within this community. I have to be in this community. So even my work um, back in the earlier work, it was always want to be the Western look. It's just there's nothing about the Asian flavor in that at all until two thousand. Um, okay, I would say 1980, 80, let me see, 1990, no, 1996 to 98, my first work about Asia. So in this time during the 80s and early 90s, were you engaged at all with the Vietnamese community in Portland? Not that much. My parents, of course, you know, they go to the temple. Mm -hmm. And so I go to the temple with them only like, say, New Year's and eight full moons. Like, there's a big holiday, I will go. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I started to stay really far away from the Vietnamese community. It's just like, I want to be an American as much as I could, you know. And so that's, that's an example from Min Tran, where we're learning about how his work was influenced by his developing relationship with the Asian community in Portland, but more in, in the Western United States. And it's a pretty good quality recording. Uh, we did it in his office and, and it worked out fine. But we come up against the challenge of, I'm perpetually trying to move the narrative back to Portland, which maybe isn't right, but it's, it's my pattern because I want to develop a history of a city. Um, God knows if that's right. Uh, now let's look at, uh, now let's listen to uh, William Vuong, who's telling us about re-education camp. That the good question and uh, meaningful. I was after the thirty-five. I was pursued by the communist officer. So they sent me. They support to. Uh, they said you support uh, go to a relocation camp. Can I? When I report at the uh, Yalong High School in Saigon, they said to me, 10 day only. What 10 day of 10 years? That's the way they talk. But many people are very innocent. They should follow the order and come to the camp. And rather that one year, one year in Savinami, Saigon, in Vietnam province. And after about six months, the officer, his name is the big, he is the police officer. He is kept away from the camp. And that's not the middle of surrounding the, the fence around the, the camp, you know. The first one, the second one, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the seventh. Surrounded. To mean to stop people you know, escape from the camp. So you can see in that interview, although it's incredibly interesting and an important witness to history, we've, it's flawed in that we can't hear him well because of the clanging in the background. There's a lot of static on the recording. This is just some of the sort of fundamental things that we've learned as we've gone through. So I'm gonna turn it over to EJ to talk about how we're starting to work on dissemination and talking, introducing people to the archive that we're creating. Uh, and EJ, please correct any errors I've made throughout my discussion as well. And then we'll go into, into discussion as a group. Unmute yourself, EJ. Okay. 
I'm going to talk about um, our only recently completed efforts to create podcasts from these oral history interviews, this collection of oral history interviews that we've been putting together for the last couple of years. Um, this started uh, about a year and a half ago when we were kind of urged to apply for a grant from the CIC or the <clears throat> Uh, Council of Independent Colleges. Um, <clears throat> the grant program was called Humanities for the Public Good, and the idea was to connect student researchers with archival collections and um, some kind of public or uh, community organization. So every college that um, applies for this grant has a community partner, in our case, it was APANO, the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon. And um, again, the idea is to sort of make archival collections more visible and more publicly relevant. Um, so Hannah put together our application for this grant and we were awarded it. And it was right about a year ago that we really started work. We began by interviewing um, I think we had about 10 students who applied for uh, these student researcher positions. And um, we're really fortunate in, in coming up with two students with very overlapping and complementary skills. Um, one of them is the editor of the student newspaper and has a lot of experience in writing for a public audience and I think was able to make really engaging podcast scripts. And then the other student um, has a background as a musician and has a lot of knowledge of um, uh, podcast technology and sound editing software. And going into this project, we really anticipated the major challenge to be dealing with some of the technological issues. Nobody in the library really had experience producing podcasts or uh, dealing with some of these software. Um, applications so uh, and we we knew there were people in the IT department who who did have those skills and who who have helped students create podcasts but um, we didn't know exactly how much time they were going to have available to devote to this project so we were pretty fortunate in finding a student who um, really I think very quickly had mastered a lot of those things and did a lot of sophisticated editing of the sound um, sound clips from the interviews and um, you know was able to put together the different pieces of the podcast in a pretty sophisticated way. So um, it, was, it was about late May of last year that the students started working and um, they made a great deal of progress over the summer. They started going through the oral history transcripts um, that are part of this collection, the Vietnamese Portland collection. And they started looking for, um, first of all, themes that they could orient each of the five podcast episodes around. And then secondly, they were looking for uh, clips or quotes that they could feature in those episodes. And over the course of the summer, um, they managed to complete three full scripts. Um, they also did a couple of other interviews um, with various uh, various individuals, um, interviews on their own to kind of round out some of the points they were making. Um, one of the, the, the student who has a background as a musician composed original music for the podcast. They attended a few events and uh, talked to people and made sound recordings. Um, um, so they did a whole variety of, of different things to contribute to this, to the project. Uh, their pace slowed down quite a bit once uh, classes started in the fall. Uh, they were both seniors doing senior thesis projects. And so um, uh, some of their ambitions, they had somewhat ambitious hopes of um, maybe going even beyond the five episodes that they eventually produced. But um, they had to scale things back a little bit when they realized how busy they were. Um, and so it was January, I think, when they recorded the first episode, and they had just 
finished recording their part of the third episode when we were um, barred from campus and they lost access to the the recording studio they had been using and um, the software they had been using to edit and put together the podcast. So um, they had to, which meant that a lot of the feedback we had been giving them, we had just listened to the second episode and started giving them feedback, but they weren't necessarily able to incorporate um, all of that into the final product because um, because of the epidemic and the uh, need for everyone to work at home. Uh, nonetheless, they, um, they really rallied and um, were able to complete the final two episodes just sort of recording on their phones. Um, and it actually sounds, sounds okay and sounds pretty good. Um, and so, uh, so they did manage to, um, just last week they finished the last episode. So they have five complete episodes which are now um, available on Spotify and on our website. And um, um, I guess before I play a little bit of um, from a little bit of a clip from the podcast, um, we also attended a workshop last summer hosted by the CIC in um, Washington D.C. And one of the things I really emphasized in community projects like this is the need to involve the community partner in a really creative and productive way. Um, and so we made a point of um, involving a board member from Apano in a, in a, in a pretty, um, she became very involved in the project and was, um, you know, consulting on all of the scripts and editing scripts and um, really engaging in a lot of dialogue with the students about what was the best way to present some of these stories and some of these narratives. Um, okay, so I think um, I will play a little bit from the podcast if I can share my screen. Okay. It was a long story. It, it's always a war story. When you try to escape, you're committing treason. At the time, there were probably 20 plus Vietnamese refugees that were squeezed onto a fishing boat. They left in the middle of the night. It was pretty espionage-like, leaving under the cover of a night sky. And we stepped out of the airplane. We talked to each other and we said, well, we have freedom. We heard about immigrants and refugees' first experiences in Portland. Because I fall in love with the Willamette River, it reminds me it's, uh, it's in my city, Saigon, downtown, they have the Saigon River. It's very similar. I just remember the smell. Like, it was just childish memories, right? Like, the first time walking into Fred Meyer in the produce department, it smelled very clean. I think for us, the kids, we adopted really, really quickly. We made friends. I think it was hard for my parents because back then, there were no, no Asians around. They made communities in Halsey Square, Urco, and Lady of Levang Church, and found assistance amidst declining social services. So, uh, every newcomer, they uh, recommend to go there, you know, unless you have a family here. But 90% nobody have a family here, you know. <laughs> so, every, you know, all, all immigrants, they, they go to the Halsey Square. So the neighborhood is just like, you know, like Vietnamese village, you know. <laughs> and all of my older brother and sister, they got job through a go agency. So a go provide training, basic skill, basic uh, language to get a job, to help with the resume and how to apply for a job. So both my parents volunteered at the Lavan Parish for quite some time, um, all the way through when I was in high school. And it was that sense of community. You, you give back to the community and 
the community gave to me, I want to give back. That's what, what I would hear from my parents. While many found solace connecting with others in the Vietnamese community, others felt disconnected from it. I don't think my father had much interest in being highly integrated with the Vietnamese community. Because I don't speak the language, I'm looked at as an outsider, uh, as an other. You know, I was a little bit embarrassed about being different in Portland. And it wasn't until I got to high school and had a large group of Vietnamese friends that I really felt associated with Vietnamese culture. Many new immigrants and refugees felt isolated because of language and cultural barriers. But you know, when we just came here, I feel like very, the, the feeling is lonely, very lonely, because you see neighbor, but neighbor is doesn't talk to you, and you don't talk to them because language, many the language is very, very, and the culture different. Even to be honest, sometimes I translate. For some people, they've been here for 20 years or 25 years. They totally don't know because nobody tell them. Nobody, you know, nobody tell them, nobody teach them, nobody educate them, nobody explain to them. Younger immigrants were often able to learn English quickly, sometimes from unlikely sources. I remember fondly, the only person I could understand was Mr. Rogers. I learned better English by playing chess. The Chess for Success is one of those programs that I continue to allude back to. It's like, that's how you learn English. You have a common denominator. That's the game of chess. I learned that from my great-grandfather and then my grandfather. So then I play and then it force, it levels the playing field. Immigrants. Okay, so hopefully this gives you a sense of um, the content of some of those episodes and um, I think basically at this point we're happy to answer anybody's questions. And I'd say we'd love to answer questions about our project but we'd also love ideas about our project but also we'd love to talk more generally with the group about other ways or ideas for creating a more complex story in archives. I came to Lewis and Clark from the National Archives, which is completely oriented around those in power, because obviously it's the government. Um, and that really allied stories. It's less a problem at the private archive of Lewis and Clark, called Collegiate Archive of Lewis and Clark, but I am genuinely interested in larger ideas about how to do projects like this or better than this uh, to create more complicated histories of our cities and our states and our areas. So we open the floor. And we've got about 20 minutes for questions. And if no one asks questions, we'll just leave. Oh, chat, okay. Uh, how are you preserving the content? That's a better question for EJ than for me, but I could also try, but EJ? Um, well, I'd say we're still working on that and haven't quite, um, haven't quite completely solved, solved that issue. We've um, had discussions about um, um, creating an institutional repository on campus that possibly would be um, one way of providing better long-term um, uh, backup to the materials, but um, we haven't really we basically have copies right now on a hard drive um, in Omeka, which is our um, digital content system, in uh, Google Drive and in Amazon Glacier. So I guess Amazon Glacier is our best long-term preservation um, source right now, but um, I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily something we're completely satisfied with. So. And the public facing storage of them, it, although it's not really storage, is this Omeka platform that we're using as the basis for the website that I put in the browser, in the, in the chat at the beginning of the session, uh, which please do look at. Um, and the nice thing about that and about digital collections in general is that they're of course easier access. So if we were create, collecting all this stuff and then storing it on campus, I would feel like we really weren't serving the community that we were drawing from that well. But because it's accessible everywhere, 
we've had a number of people from the community say they've engaged with it and they love it and they've listened to the story of their grandfather there and so forth. A question we have is how to get that even more public. And we thought about talking to the various public libraries in Portland that are in areas that are densely populated by Vietnamese people um, and instruct them on, instruct the librarians there on use and promotion of it. Um, we are working with a consultant who works with the Portland Public School System to think about integrating the content of the website into lesson plans when people talk about the Vietnamese War or the history of Portland, but we're always looking for more ideas. Um, I will repost the link. There it is. Um, other questions? I might ask the group more broadly what similar projects or if not similar in nature to this, similar in goal to this projects are happening in your libraries or archives. It, uh, uh, what is happening in the world of creating complicated stories? I think you have the power to unmute yourself so it doesn't have to all be done through chat, I think. Oh, Charles briefly unmuted himself, but then he muted again. We've heard a lot of interesting stories about projects. There's a project quite similar to this at um, Oregon State, which obviously has a great diversity archivist in Natalia Fernandez, um, who is one of the librarians I always aspire to be. Um, but uh, they also have conducted oral histories with members of various communities on the Oregon State campus, but also in the community more broadly, um, which is an excellent project. I know there's a number of projects at Portland State uh, working with Portland Black Panthers and other communities in Portland. Um, uh -huh, question. Ross, why did you think, or why did you that Lewis and Clark is the right place for this collection to live? Uh, I mean, that's a really interesting question. And I would say, uh, she wrote about that in OLA Quarterly, Natalia Fernandez. Yes, Natalia, brilliant. Um, I'm not sure if Lewis and Clark is necessarily the absolutely best place for this collection to live. Um, Portland State University has a much larger population of Vietnamese students than uh, Lewis and Clark, and we've worked quite productively with the Vietnamese student organization at Portland State. Um, as I outlined at the beginning of my talk, we started thinking about the stories that we would want to hear were we researching the history of Portland, and our students research the history of Portland quite a bit. Um, which is what led us to ask that question. Um, that's what led us to be the ones doing this project, but I'm not sure that we are ultimately the best place for it to be fundamentally. The good thing is, because it's online, it's equally accessible at Portland State as at Lewis and Clark. Um, something that makes us particularly apt for it is we've got a relatively well-supported special collections and archives department um, EJ is a historian and has a background doing this kind of oral history. Uh, we also have Zach Selly is our associate head of special collections. He's great at thinking through Omeka and digital projects and has been a real asset um, after our, our first year of project manager left helping us create the website and process the collections that we have. So I'd say Lewis and Clark is a good place for it because of our energy and interest in the question. But there's a lot of libraries that could be equally well suited, which is kind of why I asked the question, what else are other libraries doing? Because I could imagine lots and lots of places are undertaking this kind of work. Um, next question is, what platform are you using to provide the content online, i.e. WordPress Omeka? Sorry, I may have missed that. Um, I'm not sure if we said that yet or not. Uh, so it's processed and up in Omeka, and then we built the website ourselves. Uh, our digital initiatives person, uh, Jeremy McWilliams, built the website, and we also hired an outside consultant, uh, Tommy No, uh, who was also instrumental in building the website. EJ, did I miss something in that? 
You're still muted, DJ. There was a previous question. Are you looking to expand the project, for example, looking for relevant ephemera? Uh, yes. Yes, we are. Uh, <laughs> uh, on our website that I circulated, we have a link for, I think, let me look at it myself because it changes so often. Oh, no, no, I lost Zoom and I don't know where anything is. Uh, we have links for digital objects as well as, um, as well as oral histories. And those are organized both by, the, so if you click on people, you can see most people have just given us oral histories, but some people, including William Vuong, who, whose clip I played, have given us ephemera, which we have scanned and included here digitally. Ultimately, we would love to hold physical collections as well. Apano has been kind enough or energetic enough about the project to say that we can ultimately become the repository for their institutional records, which I imagine will be digital as well as physical. So we don't currently have any physical records, but we hope to in the future. And as we talk to people, we always ask if they have objects that we could scan and include digitally. I think particularly interesting um, are the digital objects that we took from uh, the seminary in St. Paul, which is, which helped, or not St. Paul. EJ, where did we take, what, where were we? Mount Angel. Mount Angel, uh, the Abbey in Mount Angel, which helped some of the earliest Vietnamese refugees and documented that process very thoroughly. So yeah, we, we are always seeking ephemera. We're less successful in acquiring it, but we're always seeking it. Other questions? And have I missed any other questions? I'm also keen to know, because I know people in the audience will be from a range of different types of libraries, whether you have ideas for uh, disseminating this information. Um, so far, all we've done is create these podcasts. We were going to have a reception for them that included a lot of people from the Vietnamese community, but then quarantine hit. We still hope to do that in the future. And like I said, we've thought about sort of unclear ideas about talking to public libraries and more substantially about talking to PPS. Um, but does, does anyone have ideas about that? Can you do a special display for a month in a public library? Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think through what we would display, but I imagine it would be like a big final poster. Is that right? Is that what you're thinking? We host an art space every month at ours with items and thesis artist books. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, um, yeah, I, sorry, I unmuted myself because I realized this might be kind of hard to think through because we've been closed for two months now. I don't remember exactly what these displays look like because I'm never in charge of them. But one recent one we had was um, their art, so it's easy because it's, you know, paintings and things. But um, it also included like a, uh, a small publicized, um, I think it was, theories by the artist or something or, or, or about the show itself. I don't remember, but it, it was, it wasn't just the art. It included some kind of a small publication. Maybe it would be cool to have like a listening station with headphones or something, or even just a jack that people could plug their own headphones into. That would be some pretty, you know, serious technology piece you'd have to get a hold of. But we, we're, we're a small public library and we do that every month mm -hmm. um, in various yeah, forms. That's a, that's a really Great idea and a fascinating example of, of the work that can be done with public libraries, which I think is what we're hoping to get started with this year. Um, and I think that there should be, I don't remember what month or week it is, but I, Asian Awareness Month? I, I, I don't remember the name, but that it, you might be, be able to time it, you know, well to something that's already on the calendar with a, maybe a festival or something that's happening in that area. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. And you make me think of the, also the Jade Night Market, which who knows if that'll happen, but which happens near PCC um, and a listening booth or something like that at the Jade Night Market might also be quite good. So yes, thank you. Those are great ideas. Um, Charles also writes, uh, I could help posting info through OLA Communications Committee Channel. That's a great idea. And thank you. Um, and Milnicki, I don't know if I'm saying Melnicki, right? But Melnicki says, do you have a public radio station that would be interested in airing your podcast? We're working with our public communications department on campus about that. Um, I think they're hopeful that they might get to OPB or another one, EJ or another one. 
Yeah, KBU or um, what's the uh, X-ray? Is that the other one? So, yeah, I think they're exploring those uh, options right now. I'm not quite sure what the status is, but um, they were waiting for the podcast to be finished before they started to try to market them. Uh, and Amy says, if you do PPS, don't forget about Beaverton Public School District. That's a really good point. Um, our, the uh, consultant that we're working with, who is Dr. Von Trong, uh, is on the um, school board or the, uh, she, did, she does something. What does she do, EJ? Um, she used to be a deputy superintendent. She's a deputy superintendent in PPS, but a lot of the Vietnamese community and a lot of people who would be interested uh, are outside of Portland in Beaverton and in Happy Valley um, and, and in Clackamas more, more broadly. So that's a very good point and something we need to remain attuned for. Hillsborough, yes. Um, yes, that's something with which we need to remain attuned because it's definitely the case that as much as we've been trying to build a history of Portland, it's really a history of the Portland metro area, including all these communities. And if we want to understand the complexity of Portland, that involves involving the complexity of the suburbs as well. Um, other ideas on this or questions more broadly about the project or other projects or questions like, why haven't you done this? I can imagine lots of correctives that we could encounter. Uh, any correctives? <laughs> Uh, well, please, if there isn't anything more, please play with the website. Um, oh, does Oregon have multicultural or diversity? Uh, does Oregon have multicultural or diversity city, county, or state entities that would be interested? I don't know, but that's a good question, and we should look into that. Um, that's a very good point, and I'm not sure, but uh, that we'll, we'll look into it. And Kyla says, any idea if there are pockets of Vietnamese elsewhere in the state? If so, their public libraries would probably welcome being included. Yeah, there, there are, there are, um, there's a large-ish Vietnamese community in Salem, um, and Vancouver, Washington has a large Vietnamese community. Um, and yes, their public libraries might be interested. The reason we didn't include Salem in this project was because just logistics, it seems like it was going to be hard to get to Salem, and it also seemed like it would be harder to ask questions that became increasingly rural. It, we initially were thinking about an urban narrative, um, but, but really you could expand the project into the rest of the state. Um, and Charles knows the Multnomah County contact, and Kyla says, uh, if so, their public libraries would probably welcome being included sc scope. Uh, yes, we should talk to them. And thank you, Charles. Uh, we could benefit from the Multnomah County contact. Uh, well, please play with the website. Um, the five podcasts are up there. And if you've run out of all of Netflix in the course of quarantine, the podcasts are very good listening as well. Hopefully they'll eventually be on the radio that you listen to as you drive to your physical place of work. Um, but until then, they're available there. They're also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Is that right? Yes, uh, and various other places, right? But yes, Spotify and Apple are the main ones. Uh, Kyla says, once the 2020 census is finished, you should be able to find information on other previously unknown Vietnamese communities in the state. Yes, that's a good idea. I, mean, I think the 2020 census will make this um, quite timely, as does the 2022 anniversary of the first Aliens Act that aimed to specifically exclude immigration from uh, Southeast Asia to the US for the first time. Uh, and Charles says, Victoria Cross Multnomah County Employee Resources Group for Immigrants and Refugees, Central Human Resources. Okay, great. That's great. We'll write that down. Uh, any other questions before we end this session? We have, we have four minutes. I, I'm not trying to give anyone the bums rush. Uh, we eagerly take questions and ideas. I think EJ is typing for a second. I thought, I hear somebody typing. Surely this is going to be another question, but it's just EJ. Uh, okay, well, that said, if you have any other questions, please contact me or EJ or Zach Selly. Um, and 
or anyone else at Lewis and Clark who can direct you to us. And we'd love to talk to you more about this project or about um, developing more complicated stories about our communities in general. EJ and I are working with the ALA to put together a book over the course of the summer that amalgamates about nine different libraries projects that are similarly focused on telling undertold or more complicated stories. Um, if you, but that said, two of our authors have just dropped out in quarantine. So if you know a project that should be covered or if your project should be covered, please talk to me or otherwise look out for that publication in the future. And until then, thank you for coming to our presentation. And I'm gonna assume that, that the tech man should, should end the meeting rather than I should end the meeting. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>